premissas que... The final statistics of the Vietnam War. Two and a half million Vietnamese killed, 50,000 Americans killed. It's been almost a decade since the women's strikes were called. We shall be free because we are everywhere! Nixon is the one. Well, I'm not a crook. I have a dream that all men are created in. Through mysticism, you could transcend the energy crisis. You see man's heart is when it cries out for reality. Man's heart cries out for the real thing, and if we're going to minister to the needs of people, the first thing that we're going to make sure of is that top billing and the center of attraction is given to Jesus Christ. We're going to have to make sure that he's in the house. Before I met Jesus, I believed all what I was told from. I was very devoted in the Muslim faith. But one day I had a vision, I had a dream. I held up to a rope that wanted to take me to heaven. On three occasions, it never worked. So in my dream, I was looking for Christians to pray for me. So when I woke up, I knew God wanted me to become a Christian. Well, before I met Jesus in 1994, you know, my life was in total mess. I was moving with bad friends, but since I came to Jesus, my life took a new direction. Jesus Christ uh, did something that nobody would have done for me. Before I met Jesus. My life was not anything to be proud of. I've lost my mother who was taking care of us in school and our father was not in that uh, position actually to continue with our education. We struggled a lot and then the war came in. My life before was not good because as an orphan, nobody to take care of me, nobody to correct me, nobody to direct me. So I was just living my life anyway. Maybe I should not have been alive today because of the way I was living my life. But I thank God because when I met Jesus, something changed in me. So it was after the war, actually, uh, that a brother, was evangelizing and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And since then, I've never turned back. I would have been a dead man because my life was not good. I remember one day my mother told me, there is nothing good coming from you. The kind of group I was moving with all of my friends, all of them have died. We used to do street fighting, smoke marijuana, drink a lot of wine, and the pastor Ed Osafa came to our house. He preached the raw gospel of Jesus Christ. His preaching was like, wow, I've never had this before. He preached against smoking, he preached against drunkenness. He preached against sexual immorality. He preached against all the things I used to do. He preached Jesus to me. And when I got saved, I got saved. Looking back on my life 43 years ago, uh, I was like looking back on a different person. I tried drug programs and tried, you know, all kinds of things and could not really get free. I'd be free for a short period of time and I'd always fall back into it, very frustrated. I was in my early 20s and I remember thinking, I don't want to be a 40-year-old drug addict. 
I still remember getting saved, April 27th, 1980, at the Door Church on Veterans Boulevard. I still remember uh, Don Parks praying with me at the altar. God didn't speak to me in a in, in, in a vocal words, but I remember feeling a feeling. He said, the things that used to defeat you are no longer going to defeat you. There was an experience I had with God where I knew I was gonna be able to climb out of my sin. I knew that God was leading me. He was gonna shepherd me out of my sin. My name is Simeon Ashungemi and my wife's name, Harriet, uh, pastor of the church in Brixton, Port of South Brixton. And I used to go to Port of South, I used to be invited to church, but I wanted none of this born again, it looked extreme to me. But when Jesus saved me, when the wages of sin got to me, nobody had to invite me anymore, I ran to the church. And Pastor Stephen was probably wondering, what is he doing here? Is this serious? Is it serious now? Is it real? Yeah, it was real. Jesus saved me then. And ever since I've been a Christian. Conversion is two sides. It's what God brought you out of. But the other side is what he brings you into, which is the church. The church has a pattern in the Bible. And that pattern is found in the four Gospels and the letters of the Apostle Paul. And it has everything anybody needs to come from shame to total dignity and honor. We realize, you know what? I fit, I have a purpose, and I am uh, important. I knew from the scriptures that God has a dream and a vision for every one of us. So I had to surrender myself to his own will and whatever he would want to do with my life. One of the most exciting thing about becoming a disciple is the security. You find safety in Christ Jesus. You find protection in Christ Jesus. And now you have become like a loving channel through which people will be saved and join you on the path for eternal life. The most honorable job in life to me is to be part of God's work, where a person's life gets connected to Jesus and the person's life takes a new direction. I mean, it's a miracle, it's a blessing. You know, the, the work that we are doing it's not an individual, it takes collective effort. And so when partnering together, doing the will of God, I think that helps us greatly. Um, my name is Pastor Emmanuel Kamara. My wife is Zainab Kamara. I've been here for 14 years now. Rokel, the eastern part of Freetown. When we came to this place, there is a change in the spiritual aspect of the people in the environment. We have made a great impact through the help of God, and that's part of the vineyard. Institutions around the church, we also help grow the church, like the school now. Um, people are coming to the school. When parents are coming and other invitees, when they saw the church, he encouraged them to be part of the church. So the school helps the development of the church, the growth of the church by evangelizing. As we are putting on the church right now, um, it's a building that we take over 1,000 people. And I believe that by the special grace of God, it we add more value to the church at large in this community. And through the help of God, you know, it has been a blessing. And I believe God is doing it. And God's name will be praised and be glorified. It is a call for every individual. There is a general call to be saved. There is a specific call into a ministry. We have the Spirit of God that is guiding us in His work and then renewing our strength on a daily basis. And so we never get bogged in what we do. My name is uh, Pastor Alusain J. Fofana and my wife, is a uh, sister Elizabeth, and I'm pastoring the Dog Christian Fellowship Church, McKinney. We have been here for the 
I passed 22 years now. And when we built this uh, church, I thought it that we need to get a uh, holistic ministry, the, 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 the church actually needs to get a school where we can actually get children coming, then we can pass on the gospel message to them. And that is why uh, the, the, the motto of the school is knowing God through education. We have seen the faithfulness of God this past 50 years. This is an evidence that the future has a lot for us. The scripture says, better is the end than the beginning. So I think with that, we're prepared to do more for God in our cities and also in our country. Christ, I used Pastor Smith to affect my life. Christ used Pastor Warner to affect Pastor Smith. Christ used Pastor Mitchell to affect Pastor Warner. Someone lay his life. Christ lay his life. Our Pastor Smith lay his life for us. And so why can't I lay my life and forgo my own comfort for the sake of raising up another generation that will raise up another generation which is in the plan and in the will of God. And that is why, uh, my brother, I'm grateful for the door, Christian Fellowship Church. You know, Jesus said, we're the, we're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We're that preserving element and the light that shines in darkness. And so we minimize the power of the church in a community, we look at all the bad things going on in the city, all the crime. Listen, we're doing something far beyond the spiritual realm that can be seen as a preserving quality. And I believe God has a conduit of his spirit into that city through the church. People have to meet Jesus. I've seen it happen, you know, in Africa. I've seen it happen in Central and South America. I've seen it happen in all these places where I've preached, where when you just preach Jesus and the message of the gospel, it is so simple, but it is so powerful. That breaks through because that's the reality on the ground of where everybody, Atlanta is kind of like the hub of the Southeast. So there's no lack of opportunities here for preaching the gospel. Pastor Warner believed in Atlanta years ago and sent a lot of churches here so we're hoping we can reclaim that. Yeah, my name is Joaquin Contreras. Uh, we are a pioneer at church right here in Tokyo, Georgia for the last three years. God is faithful and bring people to our church. When they came, they surprised the love, the welcome. You know, they're very grateful for it because they have a church in the community. It doesn't matter how another church around, but they stay to came here and they stay. People start to, to do their own relationship with God. They get the vision about the, the, the fellowship. Have a couples today. They, you know, feel the call and, uh, and, and feel like a very, very soon we're going to send that our first baby church. And uh, we're also excited for that. And, uh, it's amazing. God, God moving. God moving in our church. Kenema is the third largest city in our country. We have been able to make impact based on what we inherited. The aspects of evangelism and the making of disciples. We have been able to raise a congregation of now over 400 and then We've also been able to send out many churches. And the building project will attract many people to join the church. So the school is doing well. We have expanded. The place is now packed full of buildings. We have done a lot of developmental activities to improve the school. I know at the end of the day, when we finish this church, more people are going to be added to the church. The construction that we're trying to build, it will host over 5,000 plus. It's uh, primarily, the focus is to make it a conference center. 
whereby uh, it will host all the churches in Sierra Leone and outside of Sierra Leone who can come to this place. Even some people are saying, when you finish, I'm going to be part of this church. It's going to change the dynamics of the fellowship in Sierra Leone. It's a worldwide, universal reality that if any man, whatever nation, whatever ethnicity, whatever age, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, new creation. All things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And that dynamic is witnessed all over the world that whatever nation I have been able to preach in, I've seen that same transformative power of the gospel at work in people's lives. And they all say, this is what Jesus did for me. When you see the woman who brings in the alabaster box and breaks it, Jesus says, because she was forgiven much, she loves much. She's like, just without this guy, without Jesus, I have nothing. And that's how I would have been without Jesus. Anything that's positive, you can track it to Jesus. Same as all my friends, they grew up without their dad. So it's just my mum, single parent in like government housing, council housing. I didn't finish schooling, I left school at 14. By the time I got to about 20, looking back now, I think I was going through depression. I suppose I didn't understand the depths of the things that I had been attached to in the world. I didn't know how to break it. I just had no idea of why am I just plundering my own life like this. It's almost like I had a, a death wish or something. I just was plundering my life. And that was the very first time I encountered truth. I remember seeing my church in town and, you know, there was doing, like, singing and handing out flyers. And my daughter, she was only three, kind and she really wanted to stop and, like, dance to the music. And I remember, for me, I prayed for salvation and it was just like somebody just absolutely cleaned me from the inside out. I grew up in a, in a good home and I ended up going astray, being led astray by lots of friends and I got involved in selling drugs and um, burglaries, robberies, every, all kinds of crime, you know. Spent seasons in prison because of that. It was a life of, of stress and torment and lots of anxiety. But I, I think I was, I was searching. I really was searching for something better. I didn't actually know it was Jesus at the time. I was uh, what you would call a regular girl. When I started having relationships and then when I met Colin, who was my, I'd say, first boyfriend, first real boyfriend, I started to want to have that family, perfect family and all of that, but wasn't able to achieve it. I wanted to change. The truth is, you know, nobody wants to live like that. I wanted to change. I wanted better, but I just couldn't find it in me to change. Me and Energy, we sat down and said, look, I asked her, please, let's have a child and this child's going to change me. And I still kept doing what I was doing. I didn't change. About five, six months in, I remember thinking, I'm sure one drink wouldn't hurt me. That night changed literally everything. It was just a spiral straight back into, into sin. But it wasn't the same this time because all I remember is thinking what I had encountered in terms of being cleaned and washed and what God had done in my life, I've just thrown it all away. And then I found out that I was pregnant. It was just, my life felt unbelievable. And it's sort of like, how can anything good come from this mess? I'm, I have a child, I'm having another child, I'm not with the fathers. And I remember thinking, God, 
I couldn't do anything with my mess. It was hot. I just felt like a mess. I was at my sister's. She says, there's a flyer up there that your cousin gave to me to give to you. So I picked up this flyer and it was like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the golden ticket. And it was like an invitation to the Potter's House, South London. The next day I woke up, I came to church, Pastor Carnegie's there. He, he made a call, he says, who needs a miracle? And I remember going up to the front of that church, he prayed for me and I tell you what, that was it. I, I went home, I was like, I'm serving God now. And I just kept coming to church. I just kept coming to church. And God just kept just chipping away at me. And I sat in the jean down. I says, look, we can't live this way. And so I had to move out. And she's thinking, nobody leaves a woman for Jesus. You know, there's got to be another woman. So she comes down to the church. Let me come and see this church that is taking you away from me. So that's how I ended up coming. It wasn't out of curiosity, it wasn't out of seeking God. It was just because I wanted to see this girl that had taken my man, yeah, literally. And uh, there was no girl. It was, I've never experienced anything like that in my whole entire life. I'd never experienced church like that. Everything I saw was what I was looking for. I'm seeing couples, young couples, married, their children are sitting with them or whatever, playing whatever, and, I, and I'm like, this is a different world. It's like I stepped into a different world. It's like and all these people are achieving it and they're all saying it's God, they're all saying it's Jesus. This, is, this uh, uh, what is it? So it was like, I've got to try. I've got to try and see, because I don't know no other way. When I got saved, it was encountering God's love. But this time, I realised how much of a sinner I was. And I didn't have that when I, when I got born again. I thought, yeah, I've sinned, but I'm not that bad. And then coming away from God, knowing his presence in my life, for that to be taken away and not feel God's presence all of a sudden, that was, that's when I understood the depth of sin. One of the things that God spoke to me was that um, in 1 Peter, and he says, be holy for I am holy. For me, when I remember reading that, I'm feeling like a father saying, don't be like the world. I want you to be holy. I want you to be set apart and I want you to be separate. And that sense of a God that wants me to, to imitate him because that's what's good for me um, is what really transformed my, my thinking. I guess the way I see it with your relationship with God, it's a relationship. And God is always the one pushing the relationship. So you see that God is the God of Abraham, you know, Isaac and Jacob, it's generational. So he's relating to them differently. There's different things. What God asked Moses to do is different what he asked Abraham to do. I'm doing a study in the book of Deuteronomy, and so one of the things that you get when you talk about what God has done, one of the aspects of their faith was called the testimony. Even later, when they got the Ark of the Covenant, they had to put the testimony in the Ark of the Covenant. So the testimony was to be a reference of faith for the Israelites throughout their, their history, right? So this church has a testimony, and it's a powerful idea. If I was to th look at what you see the elements of South London that each guy is putting, I think Pastor Paul Stevens is the pioneer. He's the foundation guy. He put such a solid discipleship foundation in the men. It was some of those disciples that helped us. He had these pillars in the church, strong men of God. Pastor Carnegie came, he built upon that. I've never heard anyone push like that in my whole life. Hey, this man can pray for the dead and it'll come alive. Pastor Carnegie was the right guy at the right time for me. I think it's, you know, it's, it's early 90s and you have this American guy who's charismatic and uh, for us, he was, he could relate to us a lot. Pastor Carnegie was more like, he's more like a, a fatherly figure, right? Yeah. And then Pastor Peter comes, he's more like a brotherly figure, like for me. Pastor Peter came 
and took over the church, the church grew even more. It's like God was taking us through different phases through these men of God. You really do see the hand of God. And uh, to me, I'm so appreciative of each one of their sacrifices. So these people have a tremendous impartation of real ministry over the years. The testimony is a reference point. And when we came out of COVID, very difficult challenge. Like nothing I've faced since I've been pastoring. Like nothing anybody's faced, right? It's the testimony of, the, of those previous uh, pastor's time at, that actually encouraged me. I know God's always moved in our church. I know this church has seen revival. I know this church has produced some very good preachers. I know this church has people that go all the way back and have been well discipled. So that actually encourages me quite a bit. And so I think it's all really about seeing possibility. When you take over a church, you can't replace that person. I'm not here to replace Pastor LaValle. I'm here to carry it on from this point on. I'm grateful for the sacrifice of his Pastor Smith, Alvin Rene, and then Gene and Cheryl. They're laying their lives down and leaving behind such a wonderful church. I've had the same pastor, Pastor Warner, for 43 years, you know? And so I said, I've never been through a pastoral change. I have no idea what you're going through, but I want to walk through it with you. Uh, but the way they've received us and the way God has moved, just the grace of God, I believe, helping the church. And we're seeing visitors come, young people come all the time, and there's people developing new ministries, uh, being creative, and, and at the same time, keeping the foundation of discipleship, keeping the foundation of holiness, uh, but also making room for God to move. The bottom line is we're a family, and uh, this family has gone on for many years. You know, we, we've been, I've been part of it now for over 40 now. We are always able to forge out an understanding by working this through our pastor and talking. And, you know, I'll call Pastor Warner now, not because I just have a need, but sometimes just to talk to him. If a uh, church like this, a ministry like this, you know, uh, I've not come to Sierra Leone and uh, reach to places. I wonder what will happen to people like us. If it wasn't for the for the church being in our community, I'd be lost. This was a place. The church was a place for me to be changed. It was a place for me to be transformed. It was it was a place for me to receive a second chance at life, to love or to be loved in the midst of your mistakes, in the midst of your flaws, and have someone willing to die for you. That's what gives us hope. How else are people gonna know there's hope for me if the church isn't there? My life before serving Christ, it seemed like I was running towards nothing. And to know that there was this church here when I was going through all of that gives me the inspiration to go out and outreach more. Somebody reached out just inviting and it hit me. This is where you need to be. For most people, they they get saved and it they let go cold turkey. Well, for me, it, it took me a while. You know, I gave my life to God and I still try to find myself trying to go to the the parties, the quinceañeras, and no, oh, this is not my scene anymore. I remember just sitting there, just awkward. I didn't feel like I belong there. I didn't feel a part of anymore. And so it took a while for, for me to hit that transformation. Something, uh, uh, something happened while I was serving God. I was 14, 15 years old and I was violated. And so I'm looking at this and it's like, okay, well, God, like, where are you in this picture? I could just remember the voice of God just saying, I've got, I've got better plans for you. 
And I remember just making a solid decision in my heart to say, you know what? I'm going to just serve God. I'm going to live for God. Regardless of what happens, I'm going to serve God. And I think that ever since that time, I've always made up in my mind, or even teaching my kids, that no matter what happens, I'm going to follow Jesus. Seeing Pastor Bravo and his family serving the church without any holdbacks is amazing. Whatever God says, they'll do. There is a generational aspect uh, to the gospel. Uh, I will pour out of my spirit on your sons and your daughters, on your servants and your handmaids, whether this is geographic whether this is families, the truth of the gospel is designed to be passed on. In Psalm 78, we are commanded to tell these things, these stories to your children. We always talk about generational curses. We preach about it. We pray for people, for deliverance. but. Um, you don't hear a lot about is generational blessing. You know, the blessing that we have as believers gets passed from one generation to the next. When you give yourself in the mission field, God looks after not just you, but your children. And I really do believe God puts a hedge around you as you give yourself to the work of God. There's a blessing upon our lives because of the prayers of our parents and their faithfulness and their servitude. And that same blessing you need to contend for and, and, and enjoy, but at the same time, you need to be aware that decisions you make today aren't just affecting you, they're affecting your posterity as well. It's great, serving God with my, my two sons and my daughter. They really love the things of God, nothing forced, it was just natural to see them grow in the Lord, make decisions in the Lord, you know, make righteous decisions, just going to God for their own, for themselves. The church has been like a parent to us, you know, like looked after us. Where will I find more such a wife had it not been in the house of God? Where we not only have found destiny, but where our children are finding sanity destiny and salvation and where their children also will find the same uh, that's a vessel that God has used to bless us it's out of this world out of this world I guess that's the importance of having a church for me it is very important God has really built me up and God replaced friends with women in the church that was so um such a blessing to me in my first years of salvation. But I think it's for those who God has already got their heart. The church is the, it's like, oh, it's like when I'm in the world, I'm like a fish out of water. I'm, I'm always trying to win people and, and I come to church and I'm like, Yourself. Oh, thank God for, you know, all the passes that it took to get South London to where it was. We've been pastoring now for six years this church you know our goal has been full-time and so i'm sitting in a, in a conference in prescott in january and i i want to say it was tom Payne who was preaching a sermon do it right now you know and that's what just kept coming through my mind just do it right now why wait do it now i'm like all right i'm gonna make the decision to go on full-time and the church is excited, you know, and the hard part is, okay, you're excited, but we need the finances to be able to, to be on full time. We end up getting 40 grand just between Monday and Wednesday. My prayer has always been, God, I want to do great things for you. I 
want to be a part of what God's doing. I just don't want to voice it. I don't want to just wish it, but I want to be a part of. I want to step out in faith. The most common command that Jesus issued was follow me. And so what is a Christian? What is a disciple? It isn't just somebody who preaches behind the pulpit. In any country, in any generation, it means that we are followers of Jesus. If I want to say the truth, I am not qualified to be what I am today or to do what I am doing today. If I turn around and look back, all of the achievement, like the church I took over, it was like four um, branches, now over 120 branches. And all, most of these guys, we're going through the thick and thin of life and the issues in Sierra Leone, uh, one of the poorest nations in the world. I always encourage them, hey, let's look to Jesus. Paul says something like, from faith to faith, the just will live by their faith, right? And so th that's always been a revelation to me. Every phase of life has a dimension of faith that someone has to come into and grasp and contend for. God gives us bite-sized pieces and phases where you have a lot of dominion in this phase, then you go into another phase where you have to reapply yourself. And I think if you stay, staying connected, it's a lot about re-enlisting yourself from every so often in the work of God. Keeps you, keeps you young, keeps you alive. So coming to, to London, actually, it was one of those phases of from faith to faith, you know. Obviously, stepping out to do anything is a risk. Stepping out to do something for God is a risk, but is it, is it any more risky than staying where you are? If I'm a follower of Jesus, He forgave me, then I'm going to forgive others. He had a burden. He said, I must preach the gospel in other cities. Well, if I'm a follower of Jesus, then I carry with me that desire to see the gospel propagated, whether it's next door, uh, the other side of town, or the other side of the world. But Jesus people, when you boil it down, are always people committed to following Jesus. For me, I never felt like I was called and I never wanted to be a pastor. The scripture that I've always lived by, this would be my motif. This is, this is, this is, this is what I, 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 I've built my life around. Seek first the kingdom of God and all other things will be added. So it was Saturday night, about eight, nine o'clock. I was in my office and Pastor Peter called me and he said, we need somebody to take over the Wandsworth Church tomorrow. And I just said, yes. So to me, it's the burden. There's a burden there. Someone has to do it. You don't need to be called if you see somebody drowning. If you can swim, you would dive in. Long before we were even embracing the idea of pastoring somewhere, we were already preaching and ministering. It, we were just out there. We were driven by something that w got a hold of us. What I'm excited about in, in the future is you just continue to make disciples, and make disciples of Jesus Christ. We can't declare the gospel without declaring Jesus. It's not about a church. It's not about a denomination. It's about Jesus because he is the centerpiece of everything that we are. The work is great. God is greater and God is, will give you all the resources and I just really want to encourage you, keep on investing. Remember Jesus says, I will build my church. My church, it's his. It's never been ours. The 
outline is in the Bible, the pattern is in the Gospels. It's all there. All we got to do is preach it and teach it. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Stay right there and we're going to be fine.